Um, he said, well, give me a picture of with you in a larval tank or something. You know, it's just straight headshot. It's not that interesting. So I got my little pretzel jar of angelfish larvae and halfway hid behind it and took a selfie. <laughs> so that's what this is about. Um, I used to raise an awful lot of clownfish. I sold them in St. Louis to the local stores and some of the not so local stores. And uh, I got into that hobby and, uh, because my son was interested in having a marine tank and raised, looking at fish and corals and stuff. And I thought that was fun. He was 11 at the time. And we read everything, we studied up, and we uh, set up a beautiful 55 gallon reef tank. And about a month later, he completely lost interest. <laughs> so uh, I came my reef tank because I was really jazzed about the whole thing. And uh, I kept reading, and I came across Joyce Wilkerson's Clownfishes book, and that's what got me started with the clownfishes. My own pair didn't spawn right away, but a friend of mine gave me some eggs from his tank, and I, I managed after three attempts to raise 17 little clownfishes, and, and I was completely hooked. And then soon after that, my own fish started spawning, and I, I started building my, my uh, fishery hatchery in the basement of our house. Um, after about six years of raising clownfish, I got a little bit old. Turning the crank on raising more clownfish was not so interesting. But there were all these other species that hadn't been raised before, and some that had, and I'd love to see if I could do that too, because I do enjoy a challenge. Uh, some of the things I've raised are uh, you know, gobies. I raised quite a few of those. They were, I was told that uh, I could raise them because everybody wanted them, but nobody would buy them. <laughs> And that turned out to be true. I also raised this other kind of neagobi. It's called the yeah. MLNA. It's got a little yellow on the head. It's really pretty. Um, interestingly, when I started raising, raising these, we were waterproofing our basement the past six months. Getting ready for that means moving everything away from the walls and into the center. You have to build a perimeter drain. And um, so I had to consolidate my vast collection of junk down there. My space for fish rearing became smaller and smaller. And so I started uh, looking into smaller containers. And last year at the MBI, Ramon Villaverde talked about raising angelfish in pretzel jars. So that was the pretzel jar that, that uh, inspired me to, to try smaller containers. And I raised a lot of these, uh, a few of these, Ilcatinus elfone in these uh, black oval tubs, which are actually office trash cans from the dollar store. They hold about two gallons, and they did really remarkably well for their small size. Other things I've raised are uh, Bogacy shrimp. I did those in a two gallon um, fishbowl, chrysal kind of thing, in a water bath to keep them warm. Uh, also in that same kind of setup, I, I got some larvae from a local fish store. They got in some pikefish that had given birth in the shipping bag, and they gave me the, the little babies that resulted from that event. And on two different occasions, I raised these pikefish. Uh, this one, was a, uh, this one had a little bit of a deformity in the tail, but still, it was the one that survived of the, of the batch. And it, it got pretty, uh, pretty far along in adult coloration, and really well settled. And then it died because I didn't really have a good setup for keeping an adult pikefish. Didn't have good copepods cultures to keep them going. Although I did raise them on part of Calanus, it wasn't enough when they became older. Um, I got a second chance just this last year to, uh, to raise them again. And I got two that survived. But um, they got this gas bubble thing that, that seahorses and pikefish sometimes get. And they didn't make it. And in, uh, in these uh, pretzel jars, this is an example of a pretzel jar, I also raised some uh, of these dragonettes. These are the ruby red St. Caracos <coughs> dragonettes. They, I had this wonderful friend, Tom Christie, who lives in, in St. Louis. He has a garage full of large tanks that all the fish are spawning in. And he is, is very interested in, in captive propagation, and so he would collect the eggs of these things and give them to me. Um, because I set up to, I 
had cultures going on between them and tried to raise them. And so um, I've been on the, the forums quite a bit with these Sikirikas Ruby Reds, and I was able to get a, a couple of them to sell um, from the pretzel jar, which was kind of a nice thing. Um, but they also got put into the same tank with the pike fishes that have the gas bubble disease, and they developed the same symptoms and, and perished soon after that. Uh, then his pike, his uh, dragonets uh, jumped the tank while he was on vacation, and he had to get another pair, which are spawning again, so I'll have another chance, but um, not today. So Tom also has a pair of uh, angelfish. These are coral beauties, um, and they are spawning. And he would give me eggs from those on occasion, and a lot of times they weren't fertile or they didn't hatch. But I did get a batch that were fertile, and they did hatch. And I didn't have very much space at the time, so I, I just put them in a the pretzel jar. I didn't really expect a lot from them. But I fed them part cow and the the eye, and kept them warm and had a light over it and, and uh, I got one to 19 days. Um, you can see in the picture that it does not, it hasn't reached flexion. This bone is still really straight. And in the last few days of its life it just kind of drifted in the water. It wasn't really eating. Um, so the next time I had the opportunity he, he brought me some more eggs and I, I thought I'd better take this a little more seriously. So I set up a, a black round tub, which are these mud buckets that a lot of people use for their, um, for their cultures. Uh, it's not an expensive item. It doesn't take a whole lot of space. And at the same time, uh, well, I'll talk about that later. But, so I, I was able to raise uh, three that have survived. And here's a picture of two of them. Keep it in the wrong place. So these are my coral beauties, bay, two of the babies. Um, this one has just changed colors to adult, just changed colors to adult, and this one is not yet there. Um, at this point, before when I left, which is about a week after this picture was taken, um, this one has developed a lot more blue all around the edges and is starting to get some stripes in. The other two have developed more than this one has, but they're not, they're not changing colors yet, so I'm still waiting for the full adult coloration. Um, these guys uh, settled. Well, I'll talk about more about that later. Um, but this talk is, is uh, at least part of this talk, has to be about uh, first foods, because um, there's, there's always in, in um, In our culture, there's, there's always been the, the notion that the problems are either food or environment. And the, the food part is, has to be something that we have to deal with, but also the environment. We're going to talk about the food part first. So, uh, for clownfish, rotifers are the first food, and so I'll start with them. Rotifers, of course, divide by parthenogenesis. And if you want to keep a, a bad, uh, continuous culture going, you take about a third of it away every day, and then the next day there's more. And you have to, this also helps you maintain water quality. And for most folks, um, they culture in large containers, five gallons or more. They use RG Complete for regional culture. It's a great product. And uh, they sometimes spend a lot of money on, on fancy setups and Carboys and, and uh, you know a lot of a lot of uh, fancy plumbing to get things to work. And then um, there was a Facebook post recently asking people uh, to show us your road for setup. And so people were posting their pictures of their carboys and their buckets and, and everything. And sort of tongue in cheek, I posted this picture. <laughs> soda cup like this, with a cap and a straw. And um, so I 
looked at that one day and said, why, well, wouldn't it be great if you could culture stuff in this? If it's clear and it's easy to clean and it's dirt cheap because it comes with lunch. <laughs> so, um, how many people here raise uh, phytoplankton? And how many people have ever had rotifers contaminated with phytoplankton? A lot of you. Okay. Have you ever looked at the rotifers from those spoiled cultures under a microscope? So when I look at, at those rotifers, the first time it happened, I thought, wow, these look really good. <laughs> So, I took this picture the other day that they're actually really difficult to take a photograph of because they move a lot when they're healthy. Um, so, these, this is a rotifer here, and these are its eggs that are attached to it. There's like five or six of them in there. And there's you know, more of them like that all over the place. And all the big rotifers here have lots of eggs. And all the little rotifers are really little because they're babies. And when you want to feed new larvae, you want something small. So having a lot of new baby rotifers in your culture, in your larval culture, is a really great thing. So, um, because I don't use a lot of rotifers these days, but when I do want rotifers, I want a lot of them, and I want them to be small, and I want them to really survive well in the larval tub. What I'm doing now, it has really worked for me. What other people do is, is uh, works for them, and that's great. And some people need a lot more rotifers than I do, so maybe this wouldn't work too well for them. But what I'm doing is culturing phytoplankton and then contaminating all the cultures on purpose with rotifers. So I start with like a third of this cup with phytoplankton and then add uh, algae culture medium, which is water with fertilizer in it, to the top. And then I throw in a thousand rotifers. And what I end up with in these cups is a really intense uh, bloom of algae. And then, then one day, soon after that, it, it goes clear. It's, the rotifers have taken over, they've outgrown the algae. And when that happens, I get cultures that are, uh, let me find the place so I don't I say the wrong numbers. <coughs> One cup will produce 100,000 to 300,000 rotifers that are looking like this and young and ready to be produced. I can seed uh, a seven and a half gallon larval tub with them at 10, 10 rotifers per minute. You can start with even less than that because tomorrow there will be more. <laughs> <laughs> so these cultures are, are in the cup are when they crash, they're between 350 and 750 rotifers per mil. And I didn't have to wash any flaws or change out any water or do much more than just fill the cup and let it grow. So on this on this culture stand there was a light there. Was I'm growing algae with a light, and I'm not doing very much work. And they, so, particularly since I don't use very many rotifers, but when I want them, I want a lot of them, this is where it's going for me. But for the pelagic spiders that I'm trying to raise now that are not conifish, I really need something much smaller. I need, I need a copa pot, not the hell. And, uh, they are really, it's, a, it's an awfully wonderful thing to be able to call it breed mariculture and order hard and cows cross process. I don't have to fish them out of the ocean. So there, that's one advantage of being a landlocked fish breeder. Uh, but I need very intensive culture methods because I have a very small space. And uh, I need to have live phytoplankton because you can't culture these things without live phytoplankton. You can't culture them really without ice crisis. And I've been very lucky that I've had a pretty good run with the ice crisis that I have going right now. So the title of my talk is Small is Beautiful, but this is not a beautiful setup. Um, it's not even really, it's not a biosecure setup either. It's, it's shoving things on the shelf essentially. But I have two kinds of coat pods on here, and I have uh, about on this picture I have seven gallons of phytoplankton going. These blue handled things are pseudodiaptimus. I have three jugs of those. And I have six jugs of the parvocalinus in these milk jugs here. Here, here, and here. And then these one gallon containers are isocrisis. And I have I usually have 
seven to eight going at any time. These are um, recently propagated, and then these dark ones, obviously, ones that I'll use this week. So uh, here's, here's a better picture of those gallery books. <coughs> I got those at, at Walmart, and they were just food storage containers, drill cap. And then I have a couple of um, under cabinet lights back here. I used to just use one, but when I put two on there, I got much better results, so I have two. Ideally, you want to separate out your phytoplankton from any other living thing and have some kind of biosecurity there, but uh, I don't have the option at the moment. So I needed an intensive larval culture uh, system. And in, in 2015, the Oceanic Institute people, uh, Dean Klein and Charles Lady, published this paper in aquaculture. Because I worked at a university, I had access to papers, so it's really awesome. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that they showed, although uh, Chad pointed out some of the more salient points, just to, to uh, emphasize what the main differences for me and my cultures. Um, I get to learn about the life cycle of Parmacallus. And as Chad talked, he had a similar graph up there um, as a timeline. They start out as eggs, they hatch out into nuclei, and it takes about eight to ten days before they become fertile adults. And then they have about another week or so until all the males die. And what I, what I don't know is if the females are still fertile past this point without males if you're doing a batch culture. Um, so you could have, you could have females only in this, at this stage. So you need to be careful uh, if you're doing a batch culture as I do. Um, grow up your eggs to seven days and then take those first eggs that you get and start a new batch culture. So that by the time they get to this point, your eggs have mat matured to fertile adults and you'll have another set going. Um, so, let's see, the maximum fecundity of the of a batch culture starting with eggs is in this green circle region. This is where you're going to get the most bang for your buck in terms of producing milk and eggs, which is really what you want for a small mouth larvae. So, this is kind of a, an introductory. To this, to his paper. These were the first things that he looked at. Um, he was looking at culture density. So he had six beakers at each of these uh, density points, and he would count how many females survived given this density after a certain time period. And uh, he found that you could crowd them up to eight copepods per mill and have no effect on female. Uh, that female survival, meaning that they weren't eating each other, they weren't fighting each other, it was perfectly fine to keep them that dense. But when we looked at the production of eggs per female, eggs and not bad per female, the higher, the more crowded you got, the fewer eggs and not bad you got. And uh, then because he was looking at an in, in intensive culture system, he wanted to uh, maximize the number of uh, not being produced per mill of culture. So looking at different culture densities, he found that two adults per mill um, was ideal in this case. Um, but then the real clue for me that I didn't know before, actually I'm just kind of slightly ahead of myself. So um, things that might affect the egg and milk layout production could be uh, ammonia. So he looked at changing, how often you have to change the water to keep these guys maximally productive. And when he, he changed the water every day for three days and looked at the ammonia production, it didn't matter if he changed the water every day for three days. You still got the same amount of ammonia, it still rose a bit. But interestingly, when he looked at how many eggs and milk layout produced each day, whether or not you changed the water didn't matter at all. But, if you notice, they produce less and less as time goes by, until you're almost not producing anything in three days. Which is kind of disheartening when you're trying to raise larvae. But the good thing is, they then looked at 
removing the eggs and omelet every day. When you do that, you, or you preserve the fecundity, meaning that you, you keep making more eggs and omelet if you take them out every day. If you keep them in the same culture with the females and the males, it goes down to zero. And then when we looked at ammonia, um, when you take them out every day, it keeps the ammonia down to significantly lower levels than if you leave it in. So when I was taking out up, uh, eggs and milk that I every day, I would look at the results on my filter and under the microscope and notice that there's an awful lot of coma poop in there. <laughs> but I think that they did control for, for feces production in the study, so I'm not sure that's really the answer. But the, the first thought that I had was that, well, you're just taking out the source of the normal. I'm not sure about that. So this is a really great paper. I think everybody should read it. Um, if you want to get a copy, you need to email Dean Klein, and he can send you a PDF. I asked him if it was OK if I sent this. So, he said. <laughs> Joe, so just to reiterate, for, for part of Callum's particularly, this seems to be really a key thing, um, that you don't want to stop your adults more than four per mil if you want maximum production. You want to make sure that your females and males are, are, are fertile and young, and you want to take out the eggs and milk that every day. And I haven't really perfected the methods for doing that yet. I've learned a lot today. So the landlock advantage for someone living in St. Louis, Missouri, is that when you want cocoa pods, you can order them. Uh, so you can order them from Breed Mariculture, which I highly recommend. Uh, they, are, they either come as adults or as not breed. So if you order adults, the problem is you don't know how old they are. They come in, they could be in this age, or they could be out here. And if you want to not play after your larvae right away, when you order adults, thinking that they're going to produce, you might get lucky, or you might not. Uh, if you order not the iron, you also have a problem because by the time they get to your house, they aren't really at the end one stage anymore. They're in the middle of, of their not the eye life. So your cocoa pods probably are something a little larger than what you really want. So you can't just order a bunch in for that first day when you're already ready to eat. You have to culture them yourself. The good thing is if you order not the eye in, you know approximately how old they are. So you can just wait until they become adults. Then they'll start producing those stage one out there that you really want for your larvae's first feed. And then you're going, because you can get that every day for a week at least. And if you're smart, you put eggs in the safe for the following week so that you have new young adults to start